Welcome to this episode of Talking Sense. So we got a lot of feedback that everyone wanted an episode all about ABM. So who better to talk everything ABM than Matt Senator, the lead analyst at Serious Decisions for ABM. Matt, so awesome to have you on. Well, I mean, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. So tell me, let, let's kick it off with ABM before. Mm -hmm. So where, where it started, what was the genesis of ABM? Yeah. We'll go through a little evolution. I mean, ABM is nothing new, right? We've been doing this as great marketing leaders and great sales leaders for our entire careers. Good salespeople spent time really understanding their customers and what mattered to them and found a way to pivot their conversation or the messages they would deliver in a way that was meaningful to the audience. And marketing often would help and, and support that as well. And as, as time has evolved, that, those best practices continue to, to take place. But what allows us to go from talking to one account to multiple accounts to hundreds and even thousands of accounts is the notion of scalability. And back in the day, we didn't have the technology to allow us to do those things. Today, we have that. We have the ability to process tons and tons of information, to learn so much more about accounts, to be able to use that information in real time and change what we want to say to this account versus this account versus another account and develop a personalized experience that makes sense. So technology is really enabling a lot of the thinking that's been around forever. I think that's a really interesting point, and here's why. The, the technology we had before was designed for scale but not maybe designed to use data to personalize. Mm -hmm. So what I mean is take like email automation, mm -hmm. take inbound and like more of that lead based. So you think now that the technology is caught up, it's just allowing us to be better marketers? I think that's one of, that's one of the reasons why we're seeing the adoption of ABM uh, accelerate really quickly through B2B. But it's beyond just the technology and the ability to do some of those things. What's happened is, as companies have embraced this in a more um, meaningful way, they're starting to see some really good results. So if you think about all the people that are presenting at SD Summit, for example, our big conference, sure. you start to see practitioner one, practitioner two, practitioner three telling their stories of how they've transformed their marketing organizations. They've gone from an inbound lead gen uh, demand program to take a much more explicit, outbound, targeted, precise approach. And as that as they've had success, it's allowed other people to say, that's really interesting stuff. I want to start doing that as well. So as more and more companies are out there talking about what's working and what they're doing well, other companies want to get behind that as well. So the, the proliferation of the adoption continues to accelerate, and technology is uh, one of the reasons why. So outside of just technology, um, one thing I'm finding to be more and more critical of, of, about ABM is the role of an SDR. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So how do you see that? Do, is it possible to do ABM without SDRs? Yeah, it's, it's definitely possible, but it is a best practice to have that inside, what's called inside sales. We actually call the person an account development rep, an ADR, which is specialized okay. just for account-based motions. And so while not all companies we work with actually have that, companies that are able to have a lot more success, they've got more resources, including those ADRs, um, it's allowing them to, to achieve more, but not necessarily a requirement to do ABM. But I do, I mean, and we're, this is top of mind for, for me, just rethinking that role yeah. in an account-based world yeah. and also, you know, it used to be you separate inbound and outbound. Now it's we're calling it all bound, and I'm like, okay, <laughs> we're you know we love our buzzwords. <laughs> so all bound, uh -huh. we add that to the glossary. We have a glossary called talking nonsense. Okay. Yes, of all the buzzwords, so we can add that one now. That's good. Um, but how, so, how are people thinking about the structure of that team in light of wanting to go full scale ABM? So what we're seeing, and we even do this at Serious Decisions ourselves, we have dedicated account development reps that are focused on named accounts, and they specifically partner with an AE that has a set of accounts. 
So we typically see one ADR working with one or two named account executives to support that patch of business. And the things that they are doing are different than some of the other tele um, resources. So they're doing a lot of investigation into these accounts. So let's say something comes inbound. We've got a lead. Well, they're now taking that name. They're understanding which um, buying center or buying group that that person's associated with in that account, understanding are there other people in that account that can connect to this person. They're starting to thread these different pieces together and saying these three or four people now comprise that demand unit. It's not a single lead. And then they're also identifying other names that might not have been, that, that might not have come inbound and saying, hey, there's three other people that typically would be part of this buying team. Let's get their names and begin to do outbound to them. So you're trying to hit all different people of that buying center that all have a role to play in that decision-making process. And that's very different than just what some of the other typical inside sales people would be doing. Yeah, that's a pro, so we talked about tech. We talked about people in this world. That's a process thing. Like, just because you've got one person showing signal, yeah. don't fast track that. Definitely not. So actually, slow it down. Find the other members of the buying center yeah. so that it's really ready to kind of pass on. 100%. You can have so many people that come in that achieve a certain lead score, but they're false positives. These are people that are kicking tires, they're your competitors, they're whomever. And I would rather have three or four people that have lower level scores than one person that is that achieves the same score as the three or four people combined. Because four people involved in researching typically indicates a much better likelihood that there is something happening there as opposed to one person. So 100% with you in that statement. So reframing that, reframing the math. So let's talk metrics. This is another one of my favorite topics. <laughs> We were all wired for lead-based metrics mm -hmm. and a lead-based funnel. Yeah. How does someone start to unwind that? Is it pull the Band-Aid off? Is it start to measure these extra things? I'd like to say you could just pull the Band-Aid off, but it's not that simple. Um, it's really all about changing the philosophical thinking internally around what we're doing here. And the conversation we just had about one person isn't typically comprised a buying team, and a lead based Yeah, team, model. team, <laughs> the definition of team. Exactly. team of There's one. no I That's in team. <laughs> you heard it here first. <laughs> really, did you just come up with that? I, I might I have. Um, but if organizations think that having a certain amount of individuals that come through a funnel is really indicative of what's happening in a buying scenario, in a B2B buying scenario, it's just simply not the case. So we need to reframe that conversation and say, Listen, in, in all of our uh, buying patterns, we see five, six, seven people involved. We've got eight, 10, 12, 15 people, 30 people associated with a certain account that might be raising their hand. Those are not 30 unique opportunities. So we have to change the way that we think about progressing and measuring demand, and a lead funnel just doesn't do that anymore. So, yeah, and I mean, that's, that's one of the genesis of A Course of Six Sense is being able to better read the tea leaves yeah. and put that buying center together. Yeah. Well, the other thing that's really interesting, too, is back in the day, back in the day, right, you know, I mean, five years ago, three years ago. Well, it's, it's MarTech. Yesterday. <laughs> uh, this morning. Ancient history. <laughs> well, you would have someone that would come in into your, uh, uh, through inbound, and they would be a new lead, and we would we would say, okay, we're gonna convert them to a contact and they're now part of this account. Well, then the second one that come in, came in or the third one that came in, those would all be um, disqualified, right? Because we've already got them. Oh, there. we have an opportunity. We have an opportunity, so these people don't matter anymore. And, and so just, just reframing, not only the way that we measure, but the way that we actually activate and engage is changing and needs to continue to change. So when we think about measurement, we look at our ICP, which is not what it what it is. Justin, Justin on my team calls it an ideal clown. Ideal, <laughs> ideal clown, ideal something. Clown? I don't know. Insane clown posse. Yes. Is that what yes. That's a, you don't know the rock No. <laughs> no. He calls it the insane clown posse. <laughs> so for uh, for folks tuning in, it is not an insane clown posse. It's, <laughs> it's an ideal customer yeah. profile. I believe that you have to live and die by that segment or audience. Mm -hmm. 
and measure engagement and even building out persona maps off of that. Mm -hmm. Like that's our new awareness kind of metric mm -hmm. is what's going on in that segment. Hasn't, is anyone else doing that? Well, I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure that I can answer it because I'm not sure I'm following. So let's take a step back. If you're saying you're, you're, you're saying, hey, clients that you're working with, let's under, truly understand what makes for a good customer, right? If your company is of this size and shape and they're growing this, you know, this much and they tend to have this tech stack, et cetera, et cetera, that now is your ideal customer profile that you're saying is the, the fit for the account. So that's, that to, to me is like step one. Yeah, so, so go from there because I missed that second piece. So, but then it's like, okay, we're out doing stuff all the time and we can do stuff against a super wide audience uh -huh. or we can narrow what we do against our ICP. Yes. And so what we're doing is narrowing it against the ICP yeah. and then measuring for that segment yeah. engagement, velocity, of yeah. course, open opportunity. I mean, that's that stuff we've always done. Yeah. Um, but even like uh, new personas engaged. Yeah. And then those things bubble up and turn into an ABM strategy or campaign. Mm -hmm. But that's kind of what I'm trying to have us focused on rather than measure things like reach or awareness, which is what we would have done for very, very top of the funnel before. Yes. Yeah. Does that, now, yeah, no, now do I make yeah, sense? Yeah, yeah, you do make sense, and that, that's very consistent. And what I'd say, the other thing too is, you've got that ICP, right? So great, but you might have different strategies. So you, some of those could be net new, brand new, but even within the ICP, you could be looking for growth opportunities as well, right? Yeah, cu so, customers could be. For in customers, there. yeah. So you already know they fit your ICP, they're one of your best customers, but you've got growth versus net new, who looks like that they could be. The reality is I want to measure the throughput and the velocity and the conversion and the deal size for this versus this versus another one. And I'm going to see those differences across each of those different demand strategies and how you're approaching it. Is this more of a one-to-one, -one, a one-to-few, one-to-many? Because the reality is, is when you do that, you can really begin to see some unique differences that happen for one strategy with one set of accounts versus another. Right? And that's going to allow you to be more effective in your demand planning processes moving forward. And that, to me, I mean, that's the holy grail, right? That's what you guys talked about. I mean, I think you shed some interesting news at the conference, which was the future of ABM is, I don't <laughs> well, want to take your punchline. <laughs> that's okay. It's not my punchline. But um, what we talked about is that the future of ABM, the, the word, the terminology just goes away. Right, the reality here is that good B2B marketing needs to be data-driven. It needs to be aligned. We need to be able to have the insights to help determine who we go after, what makes sense to them, how we message to them, how we measure them throughout that process. Um, uh, and, and of course, we, we're going to change our behaviors as we reach out to them. And that's just good old B2B marketing, or needs to be good old B2B marketing. And so for companies that are on that journey where they might not be all the way right, um, we envision that they're all going to get there. And as a consequence, no one's gonna be talking about, we're doing ABM anymore, we're just doing good old B2B marketing. I love it. So what kind of data, because I, I read a stat, I think it's a Forrester stat, I don't think I made it up, I really think it's a legitimate stat. <laughs> Actually, Allison Snow gave it to me. Okay. So 13, only 13% 13 of marketers have confidence in their data. I'm not surprised to hear that. And um, our, I, I believe our marketing operations research team uh, have, probably has similar stats along those lines. I'm not as close to that research, but I do know from talking to my clients all the time, there's not one that says, oh yeah, this data thing, we got it nailed. Like, no, <laughs> no one says that. Um, and if they do, they're smoking an ideal clown profile or whatever. <laughs> They're part, they're part of the insane clan. Yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe. But what I'd say is I urge my clients, even though they don't have confidence, you can keep working on it and you can get more and you can get cleaner and it's iterative. And one of my favorite expressions, I think you asked me, uh, you know, leading into this, like what are, you know, tell, tell, tell us, you know, your favorite saying. And, and one that I think is um, apropos for this is, is that perfection is the enemy of progress. And if I sit around and wait to have the perfect, ideal uh, uh, customer data platform, 
I'm never going to make any progress. So am I gonna have some missteps along the way because the data isn't great? Yeah, but if I'm working towards trying to understand the key critical data elements that I need and I'm building that database to get some of those and I'm working that and I'm refining it and I'm getting first party information along with third party information, I'm making progress. And that should be good enough for any B2B market. Okay, so we've somewhat validated the stat that most of our data sucks. Yeah. <laughs> we'll just go with that as yeah. the stat. <laughs> what do folks do to not, maybe not be perfect, mm -hmm. but start to make progress against getting better data? Uh, one of the areas that we're seeing a lot of focus in in B2B today is um, the acquisition of information about accounts and about people. And some of that stuff is profile information, so they're turning to a lot of the data vendors to augment their database and enrich it and clean it. But we're also seeing people want to focus on more of the activity and the real-time information uh, of these accounts and the people that they care about. So a large investment in intent data, intent data monitoring. And when I now, as a B2B marketer, have a better sense that the companies that I care about that happen to be showing signals of researching activity, of browsing uh, uh, um, different websites that are all around solutions that I actually have capabilities to support, and I have that information, I couple that with my first party information, stuff that's coming out of my map and shows some of those, maybe some of those inbound leads, I see some of the third party, I see some of the first party, I really now paint a better picture of something is really happening over here, I definitely want to do some outreach. Yeah. So, so yeah. Well, we talk about it, absolutely, and we talk about it because so much of the rich activity now happens in what we call the dark funnel. Yes. They haven't, they're not coming to your website right. yet. They're doing research other places, and so without that, you're kind of flying blind. You are, you only have a small piece of the picture. I mean, there's so many people that are out there researching great solutions that you have, that you that you actually have an offering there, and they're not evaluating you because they don't know about you. They may not know about you, or they haven't thought about that. If you know that that's the case, by all means, why wouldn't you try to get out there and say, hey, I know that, you're not gonna say hey, and you're not gonna say I know, but the reality is that if someone is researching <laughs> okay. all of your competitors, and you've got a great offering here, and you know why you stack up so much better than your competitor A, B, or C, well, guess what? I'm gonna now try to do an awareness campaign that really helps illuminate that you should be thinking about me. You're making a big mistake if you don't. And they can't do that without that third party intent information. So you're in front of clients every day. Some, I'm sure, are genius, and you learn from them, which is yeah. probably a cool part of your job. Um, some, Clients and vendors, uh, the like, probably do things that are absolutely cringe-worthy. Mm. Give me your cringe-worthy moments. Like, what do people <laughs> say that they're doing that you're like, oh god? Well, first of all, I'm not shocked by what I hear anymore. So <laughs> I've been in this role for six years, and uh, you know, like all serious decisions analysts, we come out of the practitioner field, right? Leading marketing, sales, product teams. Um, and so some of those cringeworthy things we've done in our past too, we've made mistakes, we've had some successes as well. But one of the things that I, I just know, if I get on the phone with someone and we start talking about, hey, what tactics should I be doing for ABM? Should I do events? Should I do webinars? Should I do DM? Should I do? The answer is yes, yes, yes. It, I mean, if, you're, if we're not taking a step back and understanding what is the strategy, what are we trying to do, who is the account, what do they care about, we are, we're, in, we're in a tough spot there. So I'd say that's one thing. The second thing is the company, so, oh, so do you want to build off that? Do you think that the vendors have sort of contributed to that though? Because now every vendor, even if they're a tactic, claim to be ABM. So like, and I hear a lot of, and I guess what I hear a lot of is like people talk about a direct mail campaign that they're like, that's our ABM. Yeah. And I think direct mail is cool. It's awesome. It's I the new it. black. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't know. Email was the new direct mail, now direct mail is the new email. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, I wouldn't put it on the vendors. I wouldn't say it's because of them that people think ABM is a tactic. We have responsibility as marketing, as marketers as well. Um, 
is there confusion around what ABM is? Because every vendor is saying that they have a capability that's going to help uh, someone that wants to do cloud-based marketing, uh, of course. Which is true, right? Yeah. Direct mail is a part of... It can be a very effective part of a specific ABM program. I'm not going to do it to 10,000 accounts to every contact in my database, but I can certainly do it for high-value accounts, high-value contacts, late-stage opportunity potentially, and of course there are variations of that. Um, but yes, I mean, direct mail should be and could be uh, an effective part of any program. So since everyone's claiming to be ABM, what is it not? <laughs> Maybe it's that's easier, well, just to yeah, say well, what it's not. So, so ABM isn't a technology, Rodney. I'm going to start there. I, mean, I, know, yes, I, I know, know. I know. I know you know that. <laughs> and you're not, you're not someone that sits there and says ABM is a technology. Um, uh, it's also not a tactic, and it's not a one-off program. Now, companies can approach, I want to do an ABM campaign, and they're dipping their toes in the water, and they might not go to market in a completely aligned or sustainable way, and they can have some successes with that. But in our definition, ABM is a change in mindset, and it's a, it's a, it's a strategy, it's a discipline that says, the way in which we're going to drive demand is going to be different. And it really boils down to three things. It's grounded in insights, in deeper uh, accounts, buying center, buying group and individual insights. It changes the way that we align and collaborate between marketing and sales. And it changes the way in which we customize our delivery, our messaging, our tactics to that account. And those three things are the foundation for good ABM. How is ABM changing the sales and marketing roles? Are they starting to blur? What's, what's like, how does it affect our roles. One of the things that I think is a great outcome of account based is the fact that it's bringing tighter alignment between the functions, first of all. It's because very often sales would say, I have these 100 accounts that I'm working, I've got opportunities and a significant amount of them, um, and all this marketing activity that you're doing is interesting, but these people, they're, like, on, they're not on my list. They're not on, they're <laughs> And these people have got opportunities, but you're not doing anything to support them. So what you know, what yeah. gives? So it's really helped marketing recast where they want to focus their efforts and become more aligned to what sales is focusing on. So that's been a great outcome as a result of the campus marketing. Is it all the way there? Definitely not. But in terms of functions, you said blurring of roles. I would say we're starting to see more senior executives that have responsibility for both marketing and sales to try and better align those two. At the end of the day, if that person has responsibility for all sales activity and marketing activity, you're going to have better alignment in terms of the, the uh, resources that we're going to expend on these accounts. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. I have mixed opinions on that. Yeah. I think it makes a lot of to some degree, it makes a lot of sense mm -hmm. in theory. Mm -hmm. Being a practitioner, though, mm -hmm. and having sales and marketing at one time, yeah. I and maybe it's just I'm not good enough to, to do that, but I found that I ended up spending pretty much all my time on sales. Okay. <laughs> and marketing, I was like, you guys are doing yeah. great. Yeah. Keep it up. <laughs> Keep it up. Because yeah. there's just such a gravitational pull to the end of the quarter, updates for the board. I mean, it's it's a hot deal or a deal that's slipping. Yeah, and I think that's a logical reaction. And I think that the fact, the fact that you called that out as a pitfall is definitely, a, uh, it's definitely uh, there. Uh, I guess one way that we see clients solve for that too is while someone ultimately is responsible for all of it, they surround themselves with really amazing people on the marketing side, as well as on the sales side, that have a lot of those leadership capabilities as well. So those people do tend to spend a lot more uh, of their time and effort focusing just on that marketing sliver and just on that sales sliver as well. Yeah, one of the things that we've done, which I know came up a lot at Summit, is we have created revenue ops, which has been great because, I mean, I had a horrendous experience in a high stakes meeting where I had my set of books, head of sales had his set of books. Yeah. They didn't really match up. We both looked like idiots. It sucked. And so coming out of that, I'm like, I just want one sheet of music 
that we're all collaborating on, and so that has been a great move for us, is to have... When did you put that in place? Uh, well, my embarrassing experience was at another company. Oh, okay. So when I came into Sixth Sense, I was like, let's just have one person in charge of it, of it all. And yes. he has customer success, too. So he's sort of the center of insights. So, so is that RevOps in, at Sixth Sense today, it's all around data and insights and reporting? Is that the structure? That's kind of the, the, the yeah. focus of what? Okay. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Exactly. And it, we're, I mean, we're working through it. It's, it's new. Yeah. Um, but, but again, it's been nice because he's also helping with things like adoption reporting yeah. and use case reporting. Because I think as a CMO, th that's also part of my job, is making sure customers are using our solution. Sure. Um, so he's sort of helping us holistically as a revenue team look at those numbers. Yeah. And I think that's a great start. I think that's, that's the underpinnings of alignment with the data to support that. As you go broader, you got to think about strategy. Who, who, who that data is going to help set the strategy? Who now sets the strategy? Is it the sales leader? Is it the marketing leader? And that's why maybe they, Corey will just take over. Corey, you're in charge. <laughs> <laughs> we all report to Corey now. <laughs> so you're an analyst at Serious Decisions, which sounds like a pretty cool job. It is a cool job. Maybe tell us what that job entails and how one gets a gig like that. I don't know if I ever shared this with you, but I was a consultant early in my career with Peppers and Rogers Group. Okay. And Peppers and Rogers Group, for those that may not be aware, they're the ones that came up with the phrase one-to-one -one marketing, right? The preeminent CRM, one-to-one -one boutique consultancy. And this was 20 years ago, before we had this technology that we talked about, right? Like fax machines <laughs> were like the big, the big exciting technology. But anyway, I was a consultant there, and I was working alongside Tony Jaros and Megan Hewer. And Tony and Megan and I, we were all consultants helping our B2B and B2C clients. And then Tony left to go join this startup, this startup series <laughs> 18 years ago. And it was um, our two co-founders, Rich Eld and John Neeson and Tony Jaros. And one day, Tony's like, we're doing some really cool things over here. You should check it out. So I went and had lunch with them just to hear what they were about, and it was you know, it was an office probably you know eight by eight, and the, we were all they were all kind of squeezed in there, and they talked about their vision for what they wanted to create, and they wanted to be the leading company, advisory company to help marketing and sales leaders, um, because there wasn't anything out there for them. And I said, oh, that's really cool. So it's like this consulting work we're doing. They're like, it's like that, but it's it's bigger and it's better and it's different. We're not only going to be doing consulting, but we're really going to help understand and study and research a market. Anyway, long story short, I followed Tony in the careers of um, Rich and John as they as they grew this company. And six years later, and oh, by the way, maybe about nine or 10 years ago, Tony said, we have some openings on our analyst team. And I've been working with other analysts. And I just said, I'm not like, I'm not, I just don't see myself there. I'm, I'm, I'm digging what I'm do, uh, digging here. And we just stayed in touch, and eventually, the time was right. And Tony said, "There's some really cool things here." I said, "Let me explore." So I went and I sat down uh, with Rich, John, Megan, Tony, and other leaders, and I said, "Well, tell me how you do this. Like, tell me what your research looks like. Are you guys operational? Because I had worked in consulting, where we had rolled up the sleeves and did this stuff for them, but I had worked with other companies where, as my advisors, they weren't." Very, here's your report. Here's your report. <laughs> Good right? luck. Here's, your report. here's a five-year roadmap of what this looks like. Well, great, but how do I get there? Right. And so I, so I struggled with that, that, that type of model. Yeah, it was. It's kind of the in between, right? There's the we're going to come in and do it for you, but then we leave and you don't yes. know what to do. Or here's a big it. framework and you nothing got, got done. You got it. And so this, the beautiful thing about this company was it was right in the middle. So it allowed us to, to think big and, and change the game, but also help people get there. And so the more and more I talked to other analysts that were doing it, and, and one thing that stood out was the people, the, the, the sorry, the analysts, they all were so passionate about helping the customer. They all were so passionate about, about thinking differently and really helping. And just that culture was exactly what I was looking for. And six years later, it's been brilliant. I, I'm so fortunate to work with really amazing teammates. So a little more on serious decisions. Summit is always the highlight of, of our year at Sixth Sense. We go very big uh, with Summit. Yeah. For those who maybe didn't attend or didn't attend every session, what are the like 
top takeaways from Summit? The top takeaway is you have to go to Summit, so I don't have to tell you what you want. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, I'm sure Georgie would love that. <laughs> yeah, she, she would. I, I, mean, there's, I mean, how can you cover four days of marketing, sales, and product tracks into a soundbite? It's impossible. But what I'll tell you is it's all about the economics of alignment. When you bring together discrete functions in an aligned, cohesive fashion, and you understand the types of work that you should be doing and you're all aligned and you actually have a way to do it better, that's where the power comes in. And so it's funny, I was talking to some of our clients that were there and they said, I'm so fortunate this year we brought our sales team. Oh, because before they had last come. Year. And so they walked out of there with a new profound um, uh, respect and understanding of how to work together moving forward. So what I'd say is for all those people that are interested, bring your bring sales team. Bring a buddy, yes. Bring a buddy. You'll get so much more out of it. Well, I saw Jay uh, the other week, and he said there's actually some research you guys have done on the economic, like quantifying yeah. alignment. Yeah. Because it sounds like a fuzzy, like kumbaya thing, yeah. but there's real dollars behind it. But there, there absolutely is, and there's no fuzzy, there's no fuzzy stuff in the research that we do. I know that. Um, in, <laughs> so thank you. But uh, we do, we do know that. So companies that actually have a tightly aligned revenue engine of marketing, sales, and product leaders, they outperform their peers that don't have that alignment to the tune of 19. I think it's 19 percent higher revenue growth and 15 percent better profitability. So yes, the business economics, the impact is there. So. Couple of questions. What's your walk-up song? That's a hard one. That's a great question, though. Uh, walk-up song. It really depends on the mood I'm in, of course. Okay. And, and the event. So okay. I've, I've walked up to anything from uh, the Dave Matthews Band, which is my favorite band of all time, to you know I went to UVA, right? I do know that. That's where he started, Charlottesville. Yeah, Charlottesville. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we get a, we, we get a tonight. Two hours. Yeah. 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 Um, I'm a huge fan. And so it could be anything from Dave Matthews. Uh, I, I did another event where I walked up to the Black Sheep, right? And it was a, a, a 90s rap song and everything. But you're waiting. a 90s guy. Oh, so. You can't go wrong with 90s or even 80s. <laughs> anything that, that makes people move. Yeah. yeah, so no, not so much Drake. More stick into that. Drake's good too, though. Like <laughs> yeah, I'm a Drake. I'm okay. a country. <laughs> nice. I'm a country fan. All right, so we... Often we learn more from our screw ups. Mm. So, what's your most recent just colossal F up? You mean besides the last 20 minutes I've been sitting in this chair? <laughs> <laughs> Come on! Uh, uh, my biggest colossal screw up. Oh, I will tell you. I'll tell you it was one that I'm really, I'm lucky that I'm alive as a result of this. I was an early adopter of marketing automation uh, back when I was running North American Marketing for a software company. And we didn't know a lot at the time. And it was a brand new evolving technology. And long story short, what happened was, as we implemented this, we went from the sandbox to, to going live, um, we essentially lost all of our inbound leads for all, for all countries outside North America. So suffice to so say, you're like global sales. I, I literally cratered. Su <laughs> suffice to say, I was not a very popular guy for a short period of time until we worked around the clock to fix that. Uh -oh. That was um, that was definitely a big screw up. <laughs> but you learned. I learned, and then we actually ended up rolling that out globally. So. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. True. I think that's you heard it here first. I think so too. I think so too. Should that be your words to live by? Because that was my next Definitely question. Not. I think it's perfection of the enemy of progress. Again, like we're not going to get it right 100% of the time out of the box, out of the gate. So let's just let's have, let's have good intentions. Let's try to make stuff happen. Let's align people. Let's understand the roles and responsibilities and make progress and learn from it and, and iterate. That's what you have to live by. So one piece of research out of all, you guys do so much research and it's all amazing, but if people are to get their hot little hands on one piece of research, what, what should they be looking at right now? I'm going to cheat. I'm going to give you two. Okay. okay. So the first thing I'd say is the serious decisions demand spectrum is a piece of research that really helps organizations understand the different ways in which marketing should go to market, right? So we talk a lot about ABM, 
we don't necessarily need to always do or only do ABM. There are different types of marketing approaches, right? One to all, or the, um, define demand, focus demand, a ABM of scale, ABM one to one. So this piece of research really takes a step back and says there are four discrete ways that B2B companies drive demand, and there's probably a role for all four of those in your organization. That piece allows companies to be able to communicate to their constituents that we might be doing demand this way, but there's ways that we that we should maybe modify to do some other uh, approaches and what it would take to get there. So that's one foundational piece. Perfect. Another piece that I would recommend is our 2020 planning assumptions. So what does EBM look like in the future? It's a piece of research that I've been leading. It builds off of the presentation that I did at Summit with Bob Peterson and with Steve Casey mm -hmm. from Forrester and outlines five big bets that ABM leaders need to think about for the next year and for the coming three to five years. What are the five bets? You five big bets. You to get that piece of research shortly. Okay, give us uh, two. I'll tell, you, <laughs> I'll tell you a couple of them. That's fair. So the first is around um, authenticity. And as companies want to develop programs and work by determining an ideal customer profile, they're going to want to work with companies that have shared vision and shared values beyond just profit. I thought that was interesting. And I think you, you brought up- Do you agree with it or do you not agree with it? I'm curious. Because I think I got mixed reactions to that. I agree and here's why. And maybe it just comes from my own history. Uh -huh. At Aperio, we sold people. And while now at Sixth Sense, it, it's a product, I still believe at the end of the day, like great companies are made up of great people because they make the product, they produce the product, they service the product. And so having the right core values and culture and finding companies that align culturally, like I think that's where you get a longer lifetime customer value. And we actually did a study. So when I was at Aperio, we went through a whole brand exercise and we were trying to figure out what differentiated us because ProServe is hard to differentiate. So in this whole study to try to find what differentiated us, all these interviews, NPS surveys, and what kept coming back was our culture, which to me, I was like, oh God, how do you differentiate culture? Like, how do you, that's so hard to grab onto. Um, but it really forced me to think about this people first approach and make sure that we really understood what our culture truly represented yeah. and that, that we lived it and were very thoughtful about living it and delivering it and actually infusing it into our customer experience. Mm -hmm. And so while not maybe the same at, as philanthropy or being a, a, a B Corp, mm -hmm. it does say like, what are our shared values? Yeah. And potentially philanthropy is one of them. Yeah, yeah, I think that's probably on that continuum. It's, I think you're right, it's not exactly the point that I was making, but I think that is definitely on that spectrum, if you will. Um, so that was one thing that we, we I would envision that more companies are going to put, put bigger bets there. So well, Salesforce, I mean, they're the, they absolutely lead the charge in that. Google's very good at that as well, um, too. But yeah, so I think we, where we've seen B2C really excel there in the past years, companies like Pepsi and Ben and & Jerry's and Patagonia, that same philo philosophy transferring over to B2B. The second one I'll give you is the notion of adaptive programs, adaptive planning. So as, as marketers, we would often create these linear based programs and say, journeys, gonna, journeys, a buyer's journey. We're and everyone just this. marches right in a row. And wouldn't it be great if, you know, three days later, they, they're, they're ready for the next piece of information. Then we'll need another email. And the reality is people don't buy that way. So we need to, to use more real time information, more behavioral information and be able to change or modify. Or maybe that person is actually way further down the path and so we don't need to hit them with that earlier stuff so we're going to accelerate the conversation there. Maybe new people come into the buying decision team that weren't part of your original plan and we've got to get them involved. So this notion of adaptive planning is really going to be important for B2B moving forward. I like it. We're calling it next, next best action, but I like adaptive planning too. Well, so next best action, I think that's, I like it. That makes sense. It could be. So we just made up two words. We, are you going to put those in the, <laughs> yeah. the book? Yeah. I have, I have a talking nonsense book. <laughs> You, serious, you've got tons of stuff in Talking Nonsense. Oh, sure. You know, Demand Gen Waterfall. Demand Unit Waterfall. Unit Waterfall. waterfall. <laughs> yeah. I mean,
mean, that's kind of, do you get paid by those? No, we, we actually don't. And, and I, no. But you we, should. We should. I think we should change our business model. Yeah. That's probably a good idea. Yeah. I would try to get some royalties for sure. Huh. Carrie Cunningham would be a very rich man, huh? I think he might be. But he might be rich anyway. <laughs> okay. He, uh, he has a pretty nice lifestyle. He lives in Palm Springs and plays a lot of tennis. And when he's not talking waterfall, he's playing a lot of tennis and watching his beloved Red Sox. Gotcha. Yeah. Now, when you're not ABMing at Sirius, <laughs> what is Matt Senator doing? Uh, so when I'm not being a serious decisions analyst and I take my I take my blazer off at the end of the day and I put my pocket square away, <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I'm a dad. And so my, the, my first priority is making sure that my kids are loved and nurtured and well behaved and all that good stuff, right? So I spend a lot of time uh, being a dad, as as many of my colleagues um, uh, do as well. Um, I love outside of work, outside of work, and outside of my family. Personal things I love. I love baseball as well. Now it's not the Red Sox; it's the Yankees. Uh, I Ooh. love to play a lot of poker. Did you know that about me? I didn't know you yeah. played poker. I play a lot of poker. Not a lot. Not like a degenerate. A lot. <laughs> like enough. Let me see your poker face. Uh, no, I'm not. I don't have a poker face. Look at how innocent he looks. <laughs> I would never play poker against you. I don't have a poker face. You don't. No. I have a better poker face when I'm playing poker than I do in real life. So that's why I'd say that's probably, I'm, I tend to be pretty self-aware. And it's funny because I have a woman on my team, Elisa. She's tremendous. And we, um, by the way, our team is great. And we, we speak truth and candor and we really push each other. But we're really there for each other as well. And one of the things she's like, oh, I think she's like, I see steam coming out of your ears. Are you okay? <laughs> Senator, take a step back. It's okay. So she calls me out on it, which is perfect. It's a perfect way to diffuse. But um, I do a much better job of, of having a poker face in poker, in poker than, I than do, in real life. Than I do in real life. Sweet, yeah. love it. <laughs> so give us some fast stats. All the ABM stats we need. Uh, I'll start with a, with a couple. The, the first that's really interesting is you probably won't be surprised by this, but we ask companies about. How important is ABM to your overall organizational success? Do you want to take a guess at what that number is? It's a number or? It's a percent. What percentage of respondents said? Oh, oh okay, 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 okay. What percentage of respondents said ABM is either extremely, extremely important or very important to the company's overall 90. organizational success? Very good. 93. 93. And so that number has actually been hovering between 88 and now 93 over the past five years. So the reality is, is that ABM and B2B is here. It's here to stay. It's not going anywhere. Again, we talked before about the name's going to eventually go away. It's just going to be good B2B. But that is absolutely, it's not a fad, right? It's not a trend. It's here. It's here to stay. Companies are doing it. Oh, I love that. That's a okay. good one. Um, ask me again like that. That was fun. Okay. <laughs> Same one or another? Like no, ask thing. me to guess. Like, you you tell me the thing okay. and ask me to guess the uh, answer. Okay. Are you ready for this one? <laughs> I'm ready. What percentage of organizations, or actually what percentage of respondents said that they are going to invest more or significantly more in ABM in the next 12 months? 57. I got good news for you. More? Mark, your forecast just went up. <laughs> <laughs> He's our head of sales. I tone that down. Yes, 70% <laughs> of respondents said they plan to invest more or significantly more in ABM in the coming 12 months. Now, by the way, that's not just tech investment. So what is the tech money. investment? Uh, I don't have that broken out explicitly. Mm. Um, but, but a I, lot. I, I do have you would to, advise a lot. I, I, would say, <laughs> I would say there's four key things. I would say there's four key things that people are investing in. Tech is certainly one of them. Um, people the programs, and then a lot of people use outsourced agencies. Sure. Right, that are on retainer because they don't have the bandwidth or the skills to do some of those things. And around the content and creative, yeah. like that's all a piece Although of Although content it. creation actually is part of the way we categorize it, that's part of program dollars. Okay. But if I have an agency on retainer that's doing, you know, content and strategy and whatever, like an execution, it would fall under that bucket. Okay. The nuances we probably don't need to get into. Cool. What tech, ready for your next question? I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> of all the different technology categories, okay. where do you think some of the largest investment is for ABM related tech? ABM platforms. 
um, we didn't actually call out explicit medium platforms. So what are components of that? Because we want to get more granular. Okay. Probably data and insights. Mm -hmm. I would say that's number one. Number two would be maybe digital advertising. Mm -hmm. Number three would be more interesting tactics. Okay. And so I would, I guess I would group tactics to like execution channels together, like connecting up your direct mail, correct, connecting up things like that yeah. Yeah. as, as another kind of category. Okay. Um, and then probably like uh, personalization yep. and like conversion tools, like right on the site. Yeah. So things like Drift, things like Reactful, Hushly, yeah. that would be my guess. Yeah, Am I really, totally wrong? No, you're actually really close. You're right on the mark, actually. So the, the, the ones that we saw were account-based advertising and retargeting was way up there, and that continues to be up there for the last three or four years. That's kind of table stakes now. It is. It really is. What's interesting is back in the day, people thought just doing that was account-based marketing, right? Hey, just go target retargeting accounts and retarget them, and that's account-based marketing. And so, no, not our definition, but it's a good start. But yes, today that's that's table stakes. But we still see a lot of investment there. Web personalization. You talked about that. Um, predictive and intense, more of this kind of AI-driven capability uh, and data and insight. So, yeah. So, yeah, you're so right I put data and insights in with predictive, predictive. Yeah. but I could see that being its own category yeah. too. And, and yeah, it, it, it all depends on how you're defining it, but yes, I can definitely see that. We call them out explicitly saying um, data insight outside of predictive, outside of intent, those are more of the traditional like enrichment, enrichment, gotcha. and right, contacts and all that other custom research around insights for large accounts as an example. Yeah. Gotcha. So, so a lot of investment in technology, and those are some of the biggest areas. What other stats do I have for you? You are just a gold mine. There's so much. Um, by the way, you know, we, we launched the 2019 State of ABM study, which has so many great tidbits around tactics people are using, around measurement, what they are measuring, what they're not measuring. Um, around technology investment, people investment. So a lot of great research that's out there to help people really understand what the future of, Mar what the current state is of ABM and where it's moving in the future as well. What about biggest value driver for ABM? New opportunities, in, I mean, I see new opportunities, I see increased deal size, I see increased velocity, but what's like the, is there anyone that's just the, there's the three biggest drivers for why people adopt ABM are a couple of what you talked about, right? One is I need to do a better job of driving efficient pipeline into the process by understanding the right types of companies who might be in market, having the right type of message to them, getting them in. The second is doing a much better job of accelerating to close, converting that to revenue. And the third is they want to be seen as aligned with sales. We just want to be liked too as marketers, right? So those are the three key reasons why, why there's a lot of uh, folks in ABM. So we, we took that state of ABM study uh -huh. and we dissected it. And we looked at companies that were high performing versus companies that were lower performing that were doing ABM. So what is, how did you define high performing? So high performing were those that achieved double digit, uh, uh, improved uh, um, ROI on marketing through ABM versus those that didn't have that, that jump in okay. the ROI. And we noticed a few interesting stats. The first is that those high performers were 70% more likely to have executive leadership support a day-to-day -day champion, day-to-day -day leader, as well as um, secured budget, not only short-term, but longer-term to, to operationalize ABM versus those low performers. Another key stat, but any questions on that? that no, I'm, I'm wondering, are you seeing more people have an ABM role? Yeah. yeah. So that's sort of becoming a thing. Well, even let's just break down that first one a little bit more. So the executive sponsorship is really... Is it now outside of the CMO? 
Because it would yeah. make sense that the CMO is going to sponsor it. It's, it's both the sales leadership as well as the marketing leadership. Um, and in some cases, smaller companies, the CEO. When you've got that level of commitment and they're saying, we are going to do this and this is important to us and here's why. Stop. Things happen. <laughs> Things happen, yes, exactly. So that tends to be a big driver. We don't always see that. Right? We might see it on one side, but not the other, and we know that there's going to be bumps until we're actually able to align that other, that other piece of it. Uh, but also, having someone that's really focused on this day-to-day. -day. If you have someone that is doing this, moonlighting 10% of their time, and it's not a priority, and they're not measured on it, well, it's not going to really get the traction that you might want it to get. So yeah, so, so clearly, high-performing companies actually put their dollars and their focus where their mouths are and they invest and they commit to it. What's in that role though? Like how would you, because you sort of need, well we had something at a, at a Perio, I had like a, I called him a GTM, so it was a go-to-market yeah. leader mm -hmm. and they had mm -hmm. to have a lot of different skills. I would imagine if you're going to be the ABM lead, yeah. you have to understand data, you have to understand execution, messaging. Leadership, kind of, communication. Alignment, yes. It's like a mini CMO. It is a mini, they say that, yes, they absolutely have to be a mini CMO. They have to be able to, to get people to want to help you because the reality is, is that person can't do everything. They're not going to go and create all types of new content. They need their content ops people to help them. So there's a lot of selling and maneuvering <laughs> and borrowing. and um, Squeaky it, wheeling. It's, it's squeaky wheeling. <laughs> um, and it's a really, it, it is a, it's an alignment role. A lot of it and so they yes they have to be data focused and they need to understand technology but they also need to understand the people and how to get things done in their organization the second one was those high performers um, actually create much more custom content and the reality is is we're not we don't say that every ABM program needs to have custom content but in some cases it really is important right especially if you're going after a really large deal and it warrants putting significant focus and investment against it. So 30% of high performing companies were significantly more likely to customize or develop all new content that's custom versus those low performing peers. And the, again, I think the good news is the first place that we talk to our clients is to look in terms of what type of stuff do we have that we can leverage given this, this selling opportunity. Can we use this as is and maybe we just change the timing or the or the place in which we deliver it? Can we get away with maybe changing a little bit on the front end or the back end, maybe putting a logo or just general um, uh, visual identity changes? Or do we need to, to put significant work into new content creation? There's all different degrees of customization that, um, that a marketing organization needs to think about, but it doesn't have to always be brand net new. Yeah, what we've done, <clears throat> Because again, I can't create uh, like just boatloads of content. Yes. I don't have endless budget yet. Yes. Um, is we've tried to say, we, we've tried to be very focused on personalizing for timing. Yeah. So saying where is an account in their buying journey yeah. and what are they trying to know and do? What do they need to get done to drive consensus within their organization? And then all of our hero pieces, which is another you know, buzzword that we use, but all of our hero pieces are really designed around a buying job at a specific phase. And then, so that's kind of step one. And then what we've done is said, okay, there's these different buyers that buy. Where do their needs overlap? Let's create content around their overlapping needs mm -hmm. first, yeah. because we don't have enough bandwidth to create super, super specific stuff for every, yet for every single persona. Yeah. Goes back to my, my, my famous quote, right? Which is progress. We're, we're, on, the we're on the progress we're scale. We're on the progress good. scale. High performing companies were also more, much more likely to invest in emerging technology than those peers that are playing catch up. So a lot of the peers that are low performing, they're still muddling around and trying to get their their SFA and their marketing automation stuff settled and established and refined, whereas those high performers are looking at the, all the things we talked about before, the intent and the predictive and the AI and the customization and personalization. They're much more likely to be early adopters of those technologies than their 
than the, their laggard peers. Oh, well, that's good news. That is good. That's good news, uh, I would imagine, for a vendor in the space. Yeah, yeah for sure. <laughs> I'm sure you could use that stat. Somewhere. Yes, that'll be good. Yeah. All right, well, let's all thank Matt Senator, leading analyst at Serious Decisions for this episode, which was all ABM. Metrics, statistics, people, process, technology, results, just so much rich information from such a knowledgeable person. Uh, Matt Senator, again, thank you so much for coming on the show. And it was also really fun to hear what, it, what it's like to live the dream as a serious decisions analyst. So appreciate you making the trip. Thanks so much. It was great to be here.